The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. Ensemble does not hold an AFS licence nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Hey guys, it's Ben Nash here. I'm one of the co-founders at Ensemble and founder of financial advice company Pivot Wealth, which is my business baby I started from scratch a little bit over seven years ago. In that time, I've leveraged some of the learnings of the Ensemble community to scale the business to become one of the better known financial advice companies for high income accumulators in Australia. And through this podcast, you can join me each Tuesday as I have the absolute privilege of interviewing some amazing people where I'm going to selfishly be able to learn and continue my journey to improve every area of my advice business. Hopefully, you can learn a few things on that journey as well. Jump over to Ensemble.com and if you haven't already signed up to learn and share from others or simply download the app. This podcast series is brought to you by leading Australian life insurer, TAL. TAL is committed to partnering with advisors to protect the financial well-being of their clients now and into the future. TAL's accelerated protection products ensure your clients have access to cover options that are suited to their individual needs. Last financial year, TAL paid $2.7 billion in claims to nearly 40,000 customers. Hey guys, Ben Nash from the Ensemble team and today I'm here with Rachel O'Connor. Rachel is the founder and principal advisor at Florix Wealth. Uh, she kicked off her own gig about four years ago. We used to work together in a previous lifetime. And uh, Rachel, um, pumped to to chat. I had you on. I think your business was like super duper fresh uh, yeah. uh, uh, about three years ago. Um, so keen to see what's changed, what hasn't changed. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Ben. I thought a good place to start just for anyone that uh, didn't catch the previous episode or can't remember. Uh, can you give us a, how you've ended up where you are today? Yeah, sure thing. So I started in financial advice, must have been like maybe 14 or 15 years ago, um, fresh out of uni, started as an accountant, quickly realized that wasn't for me and moved into advice. Worked for about uh, 10 or so years, um, uh, worked sort of working my way up from assistant through to financial advisor at a couple of different firms. Um, And then about, so then Five years ago, had my first child. Four years ago, had my second child and started Flarix then. Um, so a big catalyst for wanting to start the business was having the kids and wanting to sort of really take control over the relationship between my career and my family um, life, basically going forward from that point onwards. So yeah, started the business four years ago. Um, and yeah, here I am now. Thought you were going to say you started because you're a sucker for punishment. Two kids under two, and you thought you just started business with your all the free <laughs> free time that you that you you have. Yeah. Well, I should. Yeah. Going back to that, I should say you know it, that was all dosed with a massive amount of naivety and blissful ignorance as to sort of what was around the corner, both as a parent and as a business owner. I had no idea what was mm-hmm. coming. Um, and yeah, I would, I would say in all honesty, the first couple of years was, was rough. Like it really sucked. And, um, I had a lot of doubts about whether I'd made the right decision. Um, but now looking back, I can say, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, it's working for me. It's working for my family. Um, and yeah, I've got no regrets. Nice. It's uh, it's good to see, and I, I think that uh, healthy naivety is is something that's borderline necessary uh, to start a business or start a family. So uh, you've killed yeah. two birds with one stone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you'd never do anything. I think if you knew exactly how hard it would impact me. <laughs> but yeah. Anyway, here we are. So it's all good. That's it. So tell us, um, what have been some of the biggest shifts in what you do? You know, in your business over the last four years. It's. Hard to say, I guess, if there have been some, any massive shifts. I'd say it's just, honestly, it's just been really incremental progress over the last four years. There's definitely been some sort of ups and downs in terms of different strategies I've attempted and then um, sort of how, you know, how we've adapted to those working or not working and things like that. But no, I'd say 
it's really just been an, an incremental, pro- like it, it just just step by step, one by one process over the last four years and just tinkering and refining the whole way along. Yeah, there were no kind of major, I, I would say I'm, I'm still now doing very similar work with very similar people to what I was doing when I started the business four years ago. Well, I know at that time that you were quite uh, considered with how you went about it with your model, like you specifically wanted to work with younger people and wanted to work under a, a structured sort of holistic model, coaching, helping people with their whole financial world. So I suppose it makes sense that that has evolved over time. Tell us what what have been the biggest challenges along the way? Um, so the biggest, let's think, what have been the biggest challenges along the way? Um, definitely, like as I said before, like those first couple of years were really hard. Um, just getting it off the ground. As a, as my kids were young, trying to work part time and start a business is really hard under any circumstances, but. One of the the big ones for us in our industry is that your PI costs are not prorated because you're working part time. Your licensing fees are not prorated because you're working part time. So none of your expenses are prorated, and and that was where I think that was probably one of the the mistakes, I guess, or not mistakes, but um, things I missed in the early planning stages was how would I you know, how do you basically overcome those fixed costs that you start with the day you open the doors um, when your plan is to only work part-time? And mm-hmm. so that just involved me essentially working a lot of weekends and a lot of nights. So I had sort of part-time childcare, but a full-time workload to, to really try and get on top of that. So that was that was a really big challenge, I would say, in those first couple of years until I reached the point where I had, I guess, the the client book to support the expenses and um you know and and sort of to be able to then start to bring in some additional support probably doesn't help that through that time we've seen probably the biggest increase in costs for financial planning like running a financial planning business that I've seen over the course of uh, the the years that I've been in advice uh, as well so yeah I- totally and yeah my my in in my first year I think in the first year of business and so I've done all my modeling and I've done all of the budgeting and forecasting for the business based on licensing sitting at a certain level and in that first 12 or 18 months it tripled um and it was already one of my biggest expenses and yeah and and that that occurring at a time when the business was really vulnerable and when I was already really stretched both professionally and personally was was one of those moments where I was like oh shit are we have I made a massive mistake here am I going to get through this well thankfully we're seeing not the PI is getting any cheaper but at least like funding levies and that sort of stuff are, are getting some sense of rationalization with you know ASIC recognizing that the the Royal Commission and the big insos were large contributors to what those costs needed to be. So fingers crossed that that's, that tempers a little moving forward. Yeah. Um, I'm keen to chat and we've been talking a little bit offline uh, today and over the last little bit about retention. And uh, I know for, for me, like in, in my business, I started seven years ago and working with, you know, not a dissimilar market that you're working with younger people, you're helping them set up financial foundations. And really success is that people start saving more, investing, you know, get a lot of the things in place. And I, I feel like it is sort of natural in that segment and it's been a challenge for us to um, you get people along the journey and then they're going, oh, well, actually, what am I going to get out of paying someone? You know, what it, what they see is one of their, probably one of their biggest expenses outside of their mortgage and housing costs for ongoing financial advice when they feel like they're doing a lot of, a lot of things right. Um, can you talk to us a bit about that you know how it's come about and and the work that you've done there yeah so i um that was yeah that was my reason for calling you a few weeks ago um because i was keen to talk to you about about that so working out so with the younger clients where maybe there isn't they say a huge pool of assets that you're managing but there's a lot of income and there's a lot of complexity and there's a lot going on um and when you do a really good job and you really make it look easy i think as an advisor we can we can make things really simple and elegant and and make it look easy and then and then people might start to question okay well maybe I can do this myself and sort of trying to I guess show people what what you do and demonstrate that value to keep 
um, to keep that relationship ongoing, knowing that that you know they really do still need a lot of your help. Um, so yeah, just I, I guess that what I've following that conversation with you and and with others and with a couple of clients as well who've been really helpful. What I've um, started working on is a few different tiers of service. Um, so up until recently, I was very um, limited in in terms of my the flexibility that I would offer. All of my clients were getting two reviews a year, paying me a fee based on that, and um, there wasn't a lot of flexibility. Um, I think that that was partly because as a new business, I was wanting to nail one thing and you know really refine that and get it right. Absolutely. But then what I've found as sort of as I've now got clients who've been working with me for a couple of years or three or four years, um, it's I, what I'm now working on is providing a, and sort of options for people to either step up or step down in in terms of how much of my time they want. So I'm now giving people the option of dropping to one review a year, keeping at two or increasing to three. And that I have found really um, has been really positively received by my clients who are, you know, maybe they, so for example, one of the clients I spoke to had just bought a house, um, which was something that we worked really hard together on helping them achieve over a, sort of a two to three year period. They bought the house, obviously we know what interest rates have done and the strategy for them turned to, we need to focus on paying down the mortgage. And so then the question came up of, should we keep paying you your fee or should we direct that money to our mortgage, um, and so what you know what we then worked through together was um, dropping down to a one review a year, so that I could still provide all of the other support that I provide to them around cash flow and super and investing and insurance and all of that sort of thing, while also giving them some breathing space to direct some of that cash flow back to their mortgage. The benefit for me in my business is it then frees up a bit of my time to then have capacity to take on another client. Um, which so once I did all of the numbers around what would this look like for my business, is it just me sort of losing business or is it actually a potential opportunity for me to um, increase my capacity? And what I found was that I actually can increase capacity by doing so, so help more people, um, give these clients sort of the flexibility they need, keep the relationship there. And so it was sort of a win-win there. And then what I've also found is that um, one thing that I've really struggled with over the years is when the scope, like the 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 demands of the client go beyond what the scope of what you've initially offered. So I would often have clients who, you know, I've, I've said I provide two reviews a year, but there was always something coming up which required another meeting or more modeling or reworking this and stuff like that. And so now with this sort of flexibility, I feel like I've got um, you know, and having these packages sort of worked through, I, I feel like I've got some something to come to when when clients are saying I need more, I can say, great, I offer more. And it's an easy then conversation to also bring in. And if I'm giving you more, I'm also charging you more. And is that what you want? As opposed to, I think, what I was definitely guilty of in the past was just being like, yes, I'll do it for you. Um, and then that sort of really coming at a cost to me in the business. Mm. So I think that that's, that's really good too. So yeah, we've now got, and, and it's really easy to talk to clients about because you can say like, you know, we all know like you might have a year where you change jobs, buy a house, um, whatever, lose a job, et cetera, and then, and you need a lot of support in that. But then there might be other times where you do just let things tick over for a little while while you recalibrate after a lot of changes. And so having that flexibility to kind of work with, offer to clients is, um, seems to be working really well. It's been really well received. Yeah, I think it's a it's an interesting one because you can't uh, you can't always foresee what might change. And it's funny that you have like we're literally having conversation with a client this morning and they've been clients of the business for about six years and they're going, Well we you know, we worked with them for I think it was like almost three years to buy their first home, which they ultimately did, and then we focus on you know, paying down the debt to a level and then buying an investment property, which they did. And then they've got an investment portfolio and they're like, well, we, we think we've got this stuff. It's like, what's going to change? But I remember having similar conversations with people just ahead of COVID and they're saying the same thing. And then, then, and then obviously COVID hit and like the whole world changed and everyone wants change as well. And so it's like, they don't always know to, that, that, you know, they, 
don't think that that will happen. Like, no, obviously, no one thought the COVID was going to happen, but these things do come up, and it means that that they're going to get value out of being there. And I don't know. I, I think for one of the things that you mentioned just when we were chatting offline, I thought was a really interesting uh, concept, and it's something that we're also working on but haven't fully rolled out yet. But just is that um, talk of the like the multi year advice journey that we yeah. like you work with our clients on a 12 month um fixed term contract and we're like you know this is that this is what the 12 months looks like and i think most advisors are generally pretty good at explaining that to people but i feel like we can almost anchor it in clients minds that it's like this is what you're doing it's a 12 month thing but at the same time we know that for them to really achieve financial freedom it's like it's going to be decade, you know, multi-decade type journey and uh, them keeping a high level of focus on their goals, you know, what they're doing and then optimizing everything along the way really does, uh, you know, provide a significant financial uplift alongside the non-financial benefits that that we all know about. Um yeah. And one thing our, our business coach has been saying to us is like, you've got to then map it out and, and show clients. And I feel like you, you sort of know, like we know that the start it's foundations and then you go through sometimes. And a lot of times I've found that there's a bit of a lull period where it's like, we're following the bouncing ball a bit. Yeah. And then like things start to, I found when you get over that three year mark that things can really start to accelerate when they've got the right chocks in place. Yeah. Yeah. Tell us about like, how, how have you been actually doing that with with your clients and and what's been the response yeah so one of the one of the so like you said with that 12 month um fixed sort of arrangement that we've got it does it does sometimes lead people to think oh and at that 12 months i'll reconsider this relationship altogether and so what i'm trying now to emphasize with people at the sign up stage and then at, at every review and so on is the importance of having or how advice adds value basically like through a business cycle um, and so Vanguard has done a lot of research on the value of advice and, and one of the biggest components that they suggest the value of advice comes from is in the behavioral coaching that we help our clients with, which doesn't necessarily get put in an SOA or, you know, it's, it's not visible. It's, those, it's just those conversations we have all the time. But how do you put a, how do you kind of express that to a client in a way that they can see it? And I think that when you think about it in terms of a business cycle, um, one of the things that I've been saying to clients is like, you know, if, if we're working together through a business cycle, there will be in that time frame there will be moments of like panic and fear and that'll be a really important point where with good support we'll be able to stay the course on a really good strategy or adapt if we need to adapt, um, you know, in those scary moments but actually talking you into sticking with a good strategy when it feels like, it's all going to hell is going to add a hell of a lot of value. Mm. And then likewise, talking you out of something kind of a bit wild and crazy at that moment in the market where we've hit euphoria and, um, you know, the, the sort of the, the basically the peak of the market, which we, you know, we've sort of seen both of those in the last couple of years on steroids through COVID. Um, So kind of anchoring back to those emotions, that sort of that cycle of emotions and how much its support an advisor can provide on that journey as well. Um, And so I'm really trying to emphasize to my clients that the value, the the most, to to get the most value out of the advice, to really get the return on the investment that you make in that annual fee, we really need to be thinking of this as sort of a five to seven year minimum type relationship to get sort of the, to really get the full value out of it. And for clients that I'm, I'm not great at this, I'm trying to get better at it, but help like basically looking at clients and say, not sort of before they've signed up and, and having a conversation with them then to work out like, if you're not really going to stick with this, if it's just a one year thing, you're probably not going to get the value out of it that you need to get. And therefore maybe you need to find, you know, work with a different advisor basically. Mm. And what's been the impact with clients of having those conversations and to your business? It's one that's sort of an ongoing conversation, which I'm just trying to start. I'm actually, it's only been in the last kind of few months that I'm trying to start to shift that conversation a bit and try to sort of evolve it a bit. Um, And so I wouldn't, it's probably a little bit too soon to, to say in terms of results for existing clients, but certainly I think it's, it's, 
sharpening up my mind at the beginning of the relationship in terms of which clients I should be taking on and which ones I shouldn't. Um, I've definitely been guilty over the years. Um, I think in that early those early days of sort of scarcity and things like that, of probably taking on clients that that maybe aren't quite right um, for my business. And so it's helping me to be a little bit more um, uh, just yeah, just to see that that initial stage a bit more clearly as to whether this is is the right client for the business. Mm. And it makes sense. And I think like with we know that the results come over time and we know the people when they're doing it on their own and not going to get the outcome. So it's like mm-hmm. it's you give someone a financial plan and then you don't work with them ongoing, like they're very yeah. unlikely to, to get the results through. So it's almost like you're serving them, you know, by doing it. And obviously there's there's better commercial outcomes attached to the business in in doing that yeah. as well. Yeah, and I and I know that I know that if 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 a client pays me for an SOA and I don't implement it, I know that I just know we've seen it. You you would know it too. Half of it will get implemented. Maybe there'll be mistakes made. There'll be and it'll be costly. It'll take longer than it should. Um, and at the end of the day, the clients will feel like they didn't get a result from the advice. That the advice wasn't good when in fact it was the implementation that it fell down. And mm. and this is something that that in the team we really emphasize like in in our work is the importance of implementing the advice because up until that point of implementing the advice everything we've presented it's just talk it's just mm. it's just it, it's it's just words on a piece of paper right mm. where where the advice has value is once we start actioning it and that's where the implementation is really important the accountability the ongoing relationship is where you get the results from advice, the upfront statement of advice. It's it's just a, a pile of paper as far as I'm concerned. Mm. And it's such a funny thing as well, like the psychology, it fascinates me like with clients that they go and engage a financial advisor, go through an advice process, make a bunch of decisions, but then it comes time to like the implementation piece and people start going, oh, maybe I should just change this thing or oh, do I really want to do that? It's like, the hell guys like you like you you know you chose to do this so and then it's you you made your choice and like there it is like you the reason that you came to an advisor and the reason that you agreed to pay money to a financial advisor is to because you wanted more savings or investments or you know better super fund or whatever those things are but yeah yeah, like i said it sort of boggles me but it also fascinates me a bit to see where where people get these roadblocks so i found for us like we went through a period where our implementation was really falling down and now we have a real focus with clients at the front end and going look you know you've come to us you come to us as the experts and because our message clearly resonates with you we have done this a thousand times before so we know what works and what doesn't so what we suggest is that if you're going to do the dance and lean into our way of doing it if you try it and you don't like it, which we know won't happen, but if you do, then we can change things. But if you try to do 90% of it, it's going to be frustrating. Then it's also difficult for us to guide you effectively around doing it because you're sort of running your own race, but with some of the stuff that we've given you. And yeah, it's, um, but it is really important. And I think particularly for we found, because it, like I said, we've got this ongoing, you know, um, process on trying to always improve our retention that people need that that implementation to be rock solid so that they're getting results so that they can feel mm-hmm. that the small wins along the way because financial freedom is you know years into the future it's like they they come to us for that but they stay because they get oh yeah we've hit that milestone or we've now we've got the investment income at this level or we've got an investment portfolio this size or whatever so yeah, it's a it is it's not an easy thing to to crack for sure, but it is an important one, particularly for those accumulated clients. At least, we yeah, can. yeah, definitely. A yeah. bit of a random question for you, but knowing what you know now, like four years into your business, what what's something that you didn't expect to be important, but you found actually is? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I would say, like, and it's a bit of it's a bit of a it's a bit of a cliche, but like keeping my own oxygen mask on at the beginning starting the business I was just sort of running on adrenaline and and coffee and just pushing 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 hustling grinding just like working 
and it and it worked to be honest like you you can you can achieve a lot just through like grit and determination but i think that that will get you through the first couple of years and then after that you, you need to sort of think about things with a real long term focus and i really try now to think about the decisions i'm making like could if if i make this change is this something i can sustain for 10 years um and if if you know, a change in the business is going to require me to make sacrifices that I can't sustain long term. Then I'm I'm getting better at saying no. Then that's not that's not going to work at all. Because what I found is that when I've really, really just relied on on hustling to you know working harder and longer to 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 make the next step. It's sort of like a I guess a fad diet where you kind of you might lose the weight, but then you gain it back really quickly and so yeah I'm 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 now finding that when I look after myself I actually love what I do and I love this business and I could see myself doing this for 20 30 years as soon as I start to give up my weekends and um you know let the hours take up my sleep time and things like that I start to hate it um and so yeah that's probably shouldn't have taken me as long to figure that out as it has but that's that's where I'm at right now well, I think you do naturally need to to hustle to to get stuff off the ground, as you say. But I think as yeah. being an advisor, there's always something more you can be doing. And then as a business owner as well, that there's there's always something else to to focus on and some somewhere yeah. you can do better or a challenge to overcome or a problem to solve or or whatever. And I think uh, I love that challenge, but also yeah. like I learned in COVID where there's like you know, freak out, is the world going to end? Is is my business going to fail? That work super hard, but then go, shit, this is just not, and particularly with, you know, young kids and stuff in the mix, mm-hmm. it's like you need to be a human being as well as a as a good worker be um, and a good good yeah. business, business owner too. On that, how do you find balance? you got a young family um, and, you know, that, that's got a, a, a bunch of uh, demands that come along with it. How, how do you balance a typical sort of week or your time to date? Yeah, so I, um, it's like I'm always tweaking and adjusting to try and make it work. Um, so that's a constant process. One little phrase that I heard on my, actually, actually on a parenting podcast was that balance, it's just balancing, it's not something you achieve, it's something you do. So if you think about like a tightrope walker, did I say that right? Anyway, you think about someone who's balancing on a tightrope, they're constantly making tiny little adjustments to stay balanced, to stay on the tightrope. And so that's what you're doing as well when you're trying to get balance in your life is it's, 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 it just swings back and forth and all of those little adjustments to keep you on track. So that helps. But in terms of like practically what I'm doing, so I, I do a four-day week. Um, so Friday is my day off um, and my kids are still at daycare, but I do a couple of things with them and I do something for myself. And what that day gives me is it's a buffer. So when stuff comes up that I wasn't expecting, say a kid gets sick or I get sick or a client has some sort of something or other that they they just need me to focus on them, it means that I have that day that acts as a shock absorber so that I'm not stressed you know, if, if say my, my my son can't go to daycare one day during the week, there's a day free that I can actually shift client meetings to um, and or do the work on that day. And so that that's a big one. Um, I work, I do all my meetings usually on Wednesdays and Thursdays. Um, and then I do like the work and um, work on the business on Mondays and Tuesdays. Um, that that helps with my family life. My husband does different days in the city to me, so there's always someone at home to do daycare and school pick up and drop off and things like that. Um, and it also means I find that that, like from a productivity point of view, I just get in that zone. I might do five meetings a day on both of those days, and it's just go go go. But then I've got I know that it's just two days, and then the rest of the week I can do the work without really um, too many interruptions. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and then I'm always like, I, I love like those productivity hacks and things like that. I'm always, you know, keen on the different strategies like time blocking and um, Pomodoro technique and things like that, which I, I use to sort of just get that little bit of extra juice out each day. Mm, totally. I found for me, I and I was saying to you offline as well, that I do my Monday, Wednesday, Fridays in the office and 
I tend yeah. to crank them with meetings, not so much on the client side, but uh, inter- internal meetings or partner meetings or whatever those things are. Uh, and then yeah. on Tuesdays and Thursdays, I'm getting better at not not taking on any meetings at all. So I can just do the, you know, the on business type stuff. And I find it is a lot more effective than you try to, you know, you've got a 90 minute block and then you're trying to get in the zone and then you're trying to change things up. Um, yeah. That you can just find a, a little bit more flow, but uh, yeah, I do that on Mondays and Tuesdays. Yeah, and I found that really helps my mental health as well because I just you know like I just find oh you know and you know the Monday itis isn't half as bad if you know you don't need to see anyone. <laughs> <laughs> that helps. That just works for me. Plus, if you if you're doing it at the front end of the week, and we do do all of our team stuff on Mondays, but having a bit of time early in the week and then you feel like you've got some wins on the board so that the rest of your time can get consumed with the in-business stuff and, yeah. uh, you know, you still feel like you're, you've are you achieved something before you've got to that point as well. So yeah, uh, I find that to be quite helpful. Yeah. Rach, my last question for you is yeah. if you could go back to your day one self and do one thing differently, what would it be? Day one... I would say I would I would be I would be more realistic about how much support I need and how much I can do on my own, <laughs> both with the kids and with the business. I'd probably I'd probably um, come in with yeah a bit more support both at home and at work because I it, it was it was a rough it was a rough little while that first um, that first couple of years and. It didn't probably didn't need to be as hard as it was, but I was trying to do it all myself. I love it. Uh, yeah. yeah, we could always do with a little bit more support. But as I said at the start, you sort of uh, jump right into the thick of it there with um with yeah. This, I was yeah. just in such a rush, and I look back now and I'm like, I didn't need to do it so quickly. Like that would <laughs> probably be. I probably that's probably what I tell myself. Like just wait six months, wait a year, it'll still be there. Like yeah. my kids were were six months and just turned two when I started the business. That was madness. Uh, that's amazing. And I'd say I've got a young family, but I've I've got an amazing wife that does a lot of the heavy lifting there that allows me to do, you know, what I need to do on the business side. Yeah. I, th- I think if I'm the primary caregiver, uh, definitely would not be able to, to balance the two. So well done. Yeah. Well, Rach, thank you so much for sharing your insights. It's awesome to to watch your business continue to, to thrive and, uh, well, Look, I'm looking forward to the next conversation. Who knows where where we'll be? Uh, yeah, yeah. Again, really, really appreciate you sharing your insights. Thanks for having me. It was nice to chat. <laughs>